Hello everyone, my name is Alonzo Julian Paul and it is such an honor to be able to speak to you today uh, from Canada all the way virtually into Cambridge. My wife and I have visited Cambridge a number of times and we absolutely love it. I, I actually used to live in, um, in Oxford where I went to Oxford University and my wife and I, we miss England, man. England is so dope. Tesco's and all those stuff, man. We miss it so much. So, hey, I, it's just thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And, and really, it is an honor. And today, I'm just going to jump right into it. Today, we are thinking probably the mo about the most difficult and sensitive objection to belief in God, which is the problem of suffering. And more specifically, we'll be looking at why would God allow COVID? Tens of millions of people have become sick and nearly one million people have sadly passed away from COVID. In fact, I just had in my house, in my flat a few days ago, uh, friends of ours, their, uh, their siblings, and they just lost their uncle to COVID. And so it's been a tough year. And it's not just coronavirus, you know, during this time, we're also thinking about other big questions when, it th when we're thinking about God. We're thinking about other serious diseases as well. My brother, uh, who was my best friend and my mentor, passed away about 18 months ago from an aggressive colon cancer. It's very similar to the one that Chadwick Bossman just recently passed away from as well. And I remember being there in the hospital holding his hand while he passed away. And, and so 2020 is tough, man. It's been a really tough year. And in this talk, I'm not going to mock any sort of pain that you might be experiencing right now with some sort of trivial, superficial level sort of response to this huge, huge question. I'm going to try my very best to, to speak to it both intellectually and to your heart. That being said, I don't think I will succeed um, today in, in my talk. I think I'll probably fail to sufficiently speak into this. But if you have more questions, with that in mind, if you have more questions, write them down and we can address them during the time of Q&A. So let's jump right into it. First thing that we need to do when we're thinking about why would God allow COVID is we need to think about the problem of suffering in general. And it's a super interesting and ancient problem. On your, on your uh, screen, you'll see a slide right here. This is a dude named Epicurus, and he's super famous in the 300s, an ancient Greek philosopher. And he raised the problem of suffering in a really famous sort of way. And same with the next slide, David Hume, who made this problem even more popular amongst philosophers and thinkers in his, in his day. And we can also look at even more modern uh, atheist thinkers like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who also does not believe in God and wrestles with this problem of, of suffering. And, and what many philosophers and thinkers have thought over the years when they're thinking about this problem is that they think that this problem is adequate in disproving the existence of God because of the existence of suffering like COVID. So on your screen, you're going to see the argument of those three guys that I just put up there, but this is just summarizing really the heart of their argument, which is this, the argument against God's existence from suffering. It looks like this. Number one, if God is all-powerful and all-loving, then God wouldn't allow suffering. Number two, suffering exists. Therefore, God must not exist. In our next slide, here's why. Since God is all-powerful, then he should be powerful enough to stop suffering. And number two, since God is all-loving, then he should be loving enough to want to stop it. Now, in the face of suffering, and especially when we're looking at a problem like this, it's, it's 
we can find ourselves tempted to think that atheism is true, especially when we look at a problem like this. You could see this online or at school maybe, or maybe you have a part-time job and you've heard this in, in some like deep philosophical, theological sort of discussion that you're having with one of your um, you know workmates or something like that. And, and you could think, man, like it's really tempting to think that atheism is true. This seems like a really knocked down argument that the suffering that we observe proves that God must not or cannot exist in our world. I want to do a little thought experiment with you. Next slide. Uh, let's pretend that there is no God. Let's imagine for a moment that God does not exist. Would God not existing solve the problem and pain of suffering? And the answer seems to be, well, no. We're still faced with the reality. And that's a really critical first point to realize that as appealing as atheism is, when you're really hurting, I bet you, if you thought about it hard enough, you actually wouldn't want atheism to be true. And because think about this, think about what it means if God does not exist. On our next slide, there's a really famous guy named Richard Dawkins. He's from Oxford. He wrote this really famous book, The God Delusion. And he says this, he's an atheist. So he says this based on his worldview, the way that he views the universe without a God. He says this, in a universe of blind physical forces, some people are going to get hurt. Other people are going to get lucky and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it. At bottom, there is no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And just like, think about this for a second, what he is saying. Think about an example of, of some evils, like human trafficking or racism or any of these sorts of things. We all want to say that these things are absolutely evil, period. That it is never okay to do any of those sorts of things, even if your entire society thinks it's okay. It's still not okay. They are unjust and they are evil. But without God, we lose the ability to make judgments in those moral categories. If athe atheism itself, listen very closely here, atheism itself is saying that there is no evil, and that there is no rhyme or reason to why you're experiencing the hurt that you're currently in. It's all just atoms. There's another author on this next slide. Her name is Susan Blackmore, and, and she's, uh, she's British, in fact. And she writes this about commenting on the, the tragedies that we see around the world. She said this in an interview. My response is that nothing matters. It's all empty and meaningless. This is just how the world is. Get used to it. Now, let me ask you, imagine, imagine someone said that to my two friends that just lost their uncle to COVID. Or if somebody said that to me after I lost my brother to cancer. Or if somebody said that to you after some uh, suffering that you've gone through, that would be awful. And it doesn't seem to be true. So again, coming back to our question today, why would God allow COVID? Our gut reaction, I think, is, okay, if God exists, and there's lots of reasons. You can ask me why I think that God exists. But it, let's say that he does. Our gut reaction is, well, couldn't he just have made a universe without viruses? Full stop. Now, that's a really good question and more complex than I think we think it is. So there's this brilliant um, Australian, in fact, um, uh, aquatic microbial ecologist and an associate professor at Giffith University. And he wrote this incredible article uh, entitled, Are Viruses actually vital for our existence. And I'm just going to read this little quote for you here. And he writes that the word virus strikes terror into the hearts of most people. Of course, we worry about certain viruses. They bring us disease and sometimes an excruciatingly painful death. 
but the 21 viral types that wreak havoc with the human body represents an insignificant fraction of the 100 million viral types on Earth. He goes on further to say that viruses are an essential part of our ecosystems. They, they keep ecosystems functioning. And, you know, and, and just so that you don't um, think that I'm just cherry picking the odd scientist here, maybe this isn't consensus science or something like that, I went and dug deeper and I got some more uh, voices that are speaking into this. On the next slide here, I have three um, very reputable scientists, uh, an epidemiologist, a virologist, and an environmental virologist that all, you can read these quotes later, that all say that viruses are essential for our existence. One of them actually says that if all the viruses were taken away right now. We would be good. We'd be Gucci for like a day and a half. But after that, none of us would be alive. Now, that's really serious. Now, here's, here's another bit for you. As I was continuing to look even deeper into the subject, there was an ex extraordinary paper that I came across um, entitled The Good That Viruses do. And this is really interesting. I'll let you read this afterwards. But there's this emerging field of cancer therapy that actually harnesses the certain viruses in order to attack cancer cells in cancer patients. The, the, the beautiful thing about this is that when you, when you do chemotherapy, my brother did chemotherapy, and chemotherapy basically just nukes everything, all these cells that are in your body. So both the cancerous cells and non-cancerous cells. And it's just really awful. You just are brought to the brink of death and, and then they try to recuperate you from there. But with these certain viruses, scientists are looking into the potential of using these viruses just to attack cancer cells while leaving healthy cells alone. This is actually so incredible that viruses can serve a good function in our world and help us in terms of medicine. So, here's the point. Why would God allow COVID? Couldn't he just have made our world without viruses? No one disputes that it is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking when viruses collide with our loved ones or ourselves and make us really, really sick. But the answer to that question of couldn't God just make the world without viruses seems to be no. Our world's ecosystems, which are essential for our species' survival, are far more complex and interconnected than we had ever previously thought. Wishing them away means wishing us out of existence. So God had to include viruses in his creation and require the existence of such things so that our planet can function and flourish. Now, I don't want to make it sound like viruses are only good, that they serve the purpose of human flourishing, environmental flourishing, as well as some positive medical benefits. They do all of those things. But I think what you and I are really wrestling with after we get past that, because a lot of people never hear this sort of material. But once we think even more down this, down this road, we start thinking to ourselves, okay, they serve a purpose. But what about that, that less than 1%? Remember Peter Pollard, he said out of, out of the 100 plus million viruses, only 27 of them. That's less than a percent, far less than a percent. But what about that far less than one percent of viruses? Because they've claimed nearly countless lives. What about those? And I think that that's a really good question as well. The Bible doesn't give us a specific reason to every single case of 
of viruses and suffering in our world. We are told within the narrative arc of the Bible that we that we live in this fallen world, that chaos and sin has entered into God's good creation, corrupting it and bringing utter destruction, which was not part of God's original design. Other cases of suffering are linked back to the supernatural realm, where beings are hell-bent in hurting those whom God loves. But I think we when we're thinking about this even more, it's like, okay, well, you know, we live in this fallen world and that might account for that less than 1%. But where is God in my personal pain? When I'm hurting, where is God? I'm going to bring this to a close and I want to tell you a story. I, I The story is I remember being in the hospital when my brother was in there and and it was awful, man. And, and I didn't know why then he was going through what he was going through. And I don't know why either right now. I don't know. And I wouldn't try and front like I did. It's perplexing and infuriating. Uh, corona, like cancer, just savages its host. And one day I remember talking with him and I remember asking him, Andrew, you know, besides being cured, full stop, what is the one thing that you would want the most while you're going through cancer? And I'll never forget what he said to me in a whisper. He says, not to be alone. And isn't that true? That deep on the inside, if we can't stop suffering altogether, then the thing that we want the most is someone to be present with us. Perhaps you know personally how deeply meaningful and comforting it is when you're going through pain and suffering. How meaningful and comforting it is when someone says, I am here with you. Right now, if you go on social media, you'll see this digital flood of content out there about Chadwick Bossman. Since August 28th, uh, when he passed away, the whole world has been posting things and writing things and posting pictures and quotes and all of these sorts of things. And I want to ask you a quick question, which is, what is the message that is being sent when we are posting about Chadwick? What's the message that's being sent to the Bossman family? And it seems to be the message is that they are not alone in their pain that their pain has not gone unnoticed, that we care deeply, and that they are loved, and that they are valued. By posting, in a sense, we are entering into their pain and saying, I am here. And that is exactly the message of the cross of Jesus Christ to a suffering world. The cross is in a broken world, God's message that he knows what it's like to be broken. Through Jesus, God enters into our pain infinitely more than we do when we are entering into the pain of others. Where is God in our hurt? He is with us. He is not cold or distant or protected from suffering. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's why they call him Emmanuel, God with us. And I just want to close with this last little nugget for you that has been deeply impactful for me while I've gone through suffering myself. And it's this. Have you suffered the abandonment of those who are closest to you? Well, so has Jesus, and he promised to make his home with you. Have you suffered overwhelming despair and anxiety? So did Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he promises you to give you deep peace and joy. Have you suffered injustice 
Well, so did Jesus as he suffered an unjust trial and was condemned to death. And he promises that one day every wrong will be righted. Have you suffered serious physical trauma? So did Jesus as he was beaten over and over and over again. He was beaten to death, even death on the cross. And he promises you eternal life with complete restoration. Have you suffered shame? So did Jesus as he hung naked on the cross, bearing our sins and mistakes. And he promises that, you will, that he will never be ashamed of you and loves you with the purest of loves. Have you suffered loss of a loved one? So did God the Father when he lost his son on the cross. Have you ever looked out into the world and felt utterly hopeless? So did Jesus' followers as they closed the tomb, rolling that huge stone over its entrance. But three days later, as he promised, he rose from that grave. The resurrection of Jesus is the ultimate hope for our coronavirus world that radically outclasses all other hopes. For it means that the ultimate tyrant, death, is not the end. In atheism, death is the end. But by contrast, the resurrection of Jesus means that when a person's heart ceases to beat, they do not cease to exist. That there is life and justice and restoration and joy awaiting after death. And in our sufferings now, Jesus knows what it is like and he is present with us in it. Jesus can help us meaningfully now in our COVID world. If you come to him because he is the lone scarred God of history. And it is only those with scars that can possibly understand the scars of others. Thank you so much for giving me a listening today, and I look forward to our time of Q&A together.